Um, I will be reviewing my research in soundscape and photography design today. We're just going to do it like this because it wasn't moving to the next slide. Okay, so before I get started with discussing my soundscape research, I just want to plug my socials. Um, if you ever want to follow me on Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter, I'm at Core Opulence, or you can check out my website. Core Opulence is the name for my PhD research um, in creative practice. And so I'm going to review my creative practice, the process of researching soundscapes and photography, and then putting that research into practice. And I'll give you an example of one of my soundscapes through uh, this piece I call Riverside Ambience. So why exactly a creative practice? I decided to go in this direction because it's a fusion of putting theory with practice. So it helps me engage in the research I'm doing. So I, I look up theories, try to understand it, but then the practical side, I put to practice and see, okay, is what I'm reading true? Is it true to me? Is it true to the listener, et cetera? And I can kind of challenge different theories um, as well, which is exciting. At the same time, I develop my skills as a um, soundscape artist and figure out exactly where do I fit in the soundscape community, my own sound, art, what exactly, where am I, what am I. Um, and then I also document the journey uh, and reflect on my work through an autoethnography, which is pretty exciting. So I can see where I started at the beginning of my research and where I go, and I can compare the two. So before I get started with talking about my work, I just want to establish exactly what soundscapes are. Much like how a landscape describes the view of the land around you, a soundscape describes the audio the sounds around you. So how do you experience the sound in your environment? Um, Barbara Schaefer, who most academics would say is the founder of the term soundscape back in the 1970s, goes to say, the final question will be, is the soundscape of the world an intermediate composition over which we have no control, or are we, its composers and performers, responsible for giving it form and beauty? So I think that's a really interesting point because it kind of um, establishes this idea of natural versus artificial. There are natural sounds that maybe we can interact with, maybe we can work, but then there are the artificial sounds that wouldn't really create unless wouldn't really exist unless man was on the planet. So this goes into this idea of how I have to pull from different disciplines to kind of understand the term soundscape. Um, so some of the disciplines I've been researching are psychology, architecture, sound design, whether that's through movies, video games, etc., different music genres. And so some examples that I have uh, are a beach. So a beach I would consider like a natural soundscape. It's not something that, um, we have to really think too hard about. You just picture yourself on a beach and you can hear the sounds of the ocean crashing or sounds of seagulls. Whereas city is, is kind of like a newer idea, right, of the soundscape. And this is more of like a man or artificial soundscape. Um, and so, so say for instance, you're trying to design a city and you need to make sure that the traffic isn't affecting um, people living in high-rise buildings or something like that. So what you're going to do um, is plant trees and hopefully those trees can mute the sounds of the traffic. Um, but that's just an example of like architecture or city design soundscapes. But as far as creating um, another world or artificial soundscapes, we can look at uh, video games for instance and what I find really interesting about video games is not only are they creating a whole new world through visuals, but they're also using sound to kind of elicit uh, an otherworldly experience. So an example of that would be um, this video game called Night in the Woods. And what I found really fascinating is one of the characters likes to jump up and down on telephone wire. And rather than maybe hearing like a boing sound or something, what they use is a piano sound. So it kind of recreates the atmosphere and creates their own little tiny world in this video game. Now I do pull inspirations from quite different areas of sound art or soundscapes or sound design, sound design a lot of different terms. Uh, one of my inspirations, her name is Janet Carta, and so what she is is a sound artist, and you can see um, kind of in the photo here that she has a video um, that she pre-took, and so what you do is you walk with the video 
but you experience the audio of the video as well as the, the soundscape of the environment you're currently standing in. Um, and she calls these her sound walks. And then I'm also inspired by the honest guys on YouTube, and they are uh, content creators focusing on meditation. And so uh, they often use guided meditations. And so you know, I'll find in my research um, some terminology that uh, correlates with what I'm trying to do are um, sound walks or uh, music narratives because in my work, in my soundscapes, I, my goal is to use sound, so not the voice, but just sounds, to provoke thought and act as like a sound mark or a sound post to kind of guide the listener throughout the journey. And I'll explain how I do that. Um, using field recordings, but at the same time, I do that with photography as well. So how does photography fit with um, uh, soundscapes? Um, with my research, I found that photography fits with music in many different areas. It's album covers, music videos, movies, video games. There's a lot of audio and visual components that fuse together to create an atmosphere. And so an example of that would be uh, the Pearl cover by Harold Budd and Brian Eno. Um, what's really interesting is they went and did their own field recordings in Malaysia. So they went to the rainforest, recorded a whole bunch of sounds, and then they used those sounds of the rainforest to put them in this album. And simultaneously, when they released the album, they also paired it with this visual. So if you couldn't understand maybe where the sound was taking you, you can use this visual as an, uh, a prompt of where you're going to go in the, the listening journey. And so that's kind of what I want to do. So uh, what exactly do I do with my research? Um, because I pull inspirations from many different areas, uh, what I like to do is just kind of walk around and take my own field recordings. Um, typically, I just use my phone to record, you know, because I'm out going for a walk, and I experiment with these different sounds. So. Um, I might take a few different recordings in the same location. I'll experiment with the sounds by editing them in Cakewalk, and then I overlay other sounds on top, or um, try to make different kinds of beats or loops, etc. And I also pair that with the photography I take while I do my sound recordings. So while I'm out doing these specific recordings, I'm taking like a whole bunch of photos at the same time to really create my own imagined space. Um, so. Why did I choose an imagined space? Because I am um, influenced by meditation and wanting to take the listener on their own journey. I'd much rather just use these sound prompts and visual prompts to let the listener do what they want with the recording. I don't want to be like a guided meditation and, and say with my voice, okay, this is what you're doing and this is where you're going. I'd much rather the listener go on their own journey. So an example of this would be, I did this um, recording called Ultimate Reality Cafe. And so rather than going to a Starbucks and taking photos at a Starbucks or, you know, another like really common uh, coffee chain restaurant, I took photos at my house, edited the photos in a way where the viewer didn't really know where exactly they were. And I purposely do not use locations with like major landmarks or that are totally recognizable because I want the listener to go on their own journey from uh, listening to my piece. Um, so, this is an example of one of my works called Riverside Ambience. Um, I took two recordings while I was out by, a, by the River Thames, and I have one recording, which is the Riverside, and the other recording, which is a waterfall. And so what I'm going to do is have you listen to the Riverside first. to go ahead and listen to the waterfall. Okay, so I think those both um, have dramatic differences and based off of the way I interpreted the sound, Riverside is very calm and relaxing to me. It's peaceful, it has various sounds. It has light traffic that's far away, it has the keys, it has the flowing water. Whereas the waterfall is very consistently loud and harsh, there's really no downtime with the recording that I have. It feels tense, it feels like there's a lot of pressure. Um, so with these two, I kind of have to make the decision, okay, which one am I gonna move forward with? Well, it's not just listening to the sound, I also need to look at my photo sets that I took during that time and, and analyze um, 
do the photos match with the sounds? And then is it evoking the emotions that I, I want uh, from the listener or from myself? So this is an example of the photo sets I took at the waterfall. I didn't really take too much because I couldn't get a different angle of the waterfall. Whereas this is the photo sets that I have from uh, the river. And you can see that there are some um, major landmarks like the bridge somebody would be able to recognize. So I decided not to go in that direction. Um, but you can see different areas uh, of the water and um, entering the water that um, could be useful for, for me. So um, typically photo sets, I might take 50, 50 photos while I'm out. I might take less, I might take more. It really depends on, on the location. And so what I do is then I take those photos and I edit them in Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, and these are the final two photos that I decided to roll with. You um, can see that the, um, the Riverside one is, is kind of muted and the focus is a bit um, different. Whereas the waterfall, you can tell that it's a very sharp, clear image. And I feel like both these images relate to their corresponding sounds. Um, but moving forward, when I develop my sounds, I have to ask myself, okay, what do I want and what, do I, what don't I want? And sometimes it's a lot easier to figure out what I don't want first. And so because I'm inspired by a lot of meditation music and I just enjoy having like background noises and stuff while I'm working or studying, typically um, the way I generate my soundscapes is for like a peaceful atmosphere. So I knew I didn't want that harsh scary noise of the waterfall instead I went with the peaceful sounds of the geese and the slow moving water so yeah I would say emotion feeling and expression certainly come into consideration for whenever I make my own soundscapes and so um what I did was I was able to um use cakewalk import my field recordings from the riverside and then I was able to manipulate some of the sounds and to create a, a really small piece. Um, so if you can go ahead and share my, my piece on YouTube, that would really be really nice. Okay, can you see that now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great, so hopefully this has sound too. And it kind of feels like you're you're sitting there in your own little soundscape. And what's really nice about the way that I target my audience is I post everything on YouTube. And the reason why I decided to go with YouTube is one, it's a familiar format for me, but two, because I'm an individual and when I go out um, taking these field recordings, it's like my own form of meditation. I'm by myself. It's just a really a moment to be with myself, reflect, and meditate. And so what I do is I, I come into um, your living room or your bedroom and it's just you and the music or me and the music and so I connect with my listeners on an individual level. Um, you know, it's up to them on how they decide on listening to the piece. They could be fully engaged with it or they could have it on in the background, but my hope is to elicit uh, feelings of calm, peace, um, but at the same time, uh, really experience that the soundscape on, on their own level as well. So, with the sounds of the the wind blowing, for instance, those are all authentic sounds. But what I found really interesting in my research is that sometimes wind or other sounds don't necessarily have to be field recordings in order to get the same emotions evoked or the same feelings. So going back to um, the uh, example I had of Night in the Woods, the video game, how they decided to make the wind was they were just blowing into a microphone with their mouth. And so you can create different sounds um, that like elicit the same responses. Another example is they field recorded um, frogs, but rather than using them as frog noises, they edited them to make them sound like fireflies instead. Um, I wouldn't say that I've necessarily gotten to that point of manipulating sound in that degree. I usually like to just have the authentic noises 
um, that I record, and then I just pair them with like a loop or something. You could hear like the kind of piano in the background of that, just to create some sort of consistency because typically my field recordings don't have consistency with them. So it's just like a, a feeling of predictability, I suppose, which also brings the, the feeling of peace and calm that I'm looking for. So yeah, I think that's it for me. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Madison. Um, I just might just kick things off while people are thinking. Um, it, it might be a slightly cliched question in some ways, Madison, but I was just wondering about how you know the events of the last eighteen months have kind of impacted upon your project. I was thinking about soundscapes and the kind of stillness of some of your projects. I was just thinking about how things like lockdowns all that had kind of affected your your practice. Um, it's definitely affected it in various ways. Uh, originally, towards the end of my PhD, my goal was to have um, like an in-person session, kind of like an installation of sorts, but I found that, you know, it's just a lot easier doing it online. I can reach more people, um, have a bigger audience, but it makes more sense because I am going out by myself doing these recordings. It's my own meditative experience alone just doing this, and so I think just targeting people as individuals through YouTube is probably the best format moving forward. Um, but what I also found is the soundscapes in general change. So for instance, I live near London, and London is usually really loud and busy. However, when the pandemic hit, um, soundscape changed, less traffic, less people, quiet, very quiet, very weird. <laughs> so um, it's really fascinating how when you actually take the time to listen to the soundscapes around you, how it, how it can change over time depending on type of day, pandemic, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a question, comment, question from Steve in the chat. He says, do you know Chris Watson's work with the National Gallery? He specialises in creating spatial sound installations uh, which feature a strong sense of spirit of place. I've actually heard of Chris, Chris Watson, but I haven't yet dived into that. I've been, though I take a lot of inspiration, sometimes I go down rabbit, rabbit holes I can't get out of. Um, and I think a lot of us are familiar with PhD research, it's just it is what it is. Right now I've been primarily focusing on um, sound design with like video games and stuff and watching uh, interviews of how they how they do this and i feel like being able to watch these interviews and kind of understand their process helps me reflect more on my work and how to describe it and how i make the decisions that i make but yes i will definitely look into that because it seems like uh something that would really benefit me steve you want to just comment on that sorry i just muted I was definitely looking for the raised hand um, icon and eventually found it. Um, Madison, um, I just wonder what, a couple of things really, as a, as a sound recordist myself um, in film and television, now in academia, what, what, what you use to record on? Well, that's a good question. I'm pretty bootleg, um, so I just use my cell phone. Um, and you know what? It doesn't really affect the quality too much. I, I think I kind of like doing it like that just because I've, all, I've been self-taught with music, I've been self-taught with photography, and I feel like, you know what, it is what it is. It's me, so I'm okay with it. Um, and then at the same time with like Cakewalk or um, Audacity or whatever I decide to use, I can always edit the sounds to make them a little bit sharper if I really need to, but typically I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I wonder whether you were sort of thinking of developing how you did your location work and maybe getting into... Um you know, immersive recording of the all of those environments that you that you go into. I think that might be a little overwhelming by myself. I think I would need like structure and maybe somebody like a mentor because I think doing it on my own, I don't know if I'd be able to focus enough. Plus, I'm also afraid of the unknown. So yes, definitely, I definitely need a mentor. <laughs> okay. Good, luck. Good. Well, good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. And um, a question from Madison, for Madison from Elsa as well. It's really interesting how you consider whether or not to include landmarks in the photography uh, part of your works. Do you similarly consider recognisable or not recognisable sounds? I think I use a fusion of both. Um, I mean, one of my dominant um, things that I use is field recordings, and so you can't really run away with <laughs> not recognising 
recognizing those sounds unless you live in a bubble. Um, so an example, I, I like using my alternate reality cafe and we have listened to it today, but um, it's a really good example. What I did was I just recorded myself making um, coffee at my house and recorded the, the water brewing, the stirring of the cup, etc. And so I think that anybody who's a coffee drinker or a tea drinker, they can associate these sounds with what, what I'm doing. Um, and so it's this term called sound mark, which is kind of like a sign post. These sound marks correlate to different sounds we're familiar with, whether it's through experience, through culture, something like that. We automatically associate certain feelings, emotions, experiences with these sounds. And so because I want to take my listeners on a narrative journey, I use these familiar sounds to kind of walk them through. Um, another example of narrative sound, like narrative soundscape was this piece I created called um, Shower Thoughts. And so I had the consistent water running in the background from the shower. I still recorded myself in the shower. <laughs> I just use that sound. Then I lead... Um, uh, sounds over top of it of me doing the dishes, me doing chores, me taking out the trash because I wanted to create this this experience of these are the things I'm thinking about in the shower. It's stressful. Like sometimes taking a shower is peaceful, but when your brain starts thinking about oh wow, these are the things I need to get done with my day, um, I just use those sounds as kind of like a signpost to let people know maybe my thoughts while I'm in the shower and subsequently like. A lot of people can relate to that because they are the familiar sounds that we all kind of know. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Thanks for those answers. And the final call for any last questions, just as we finish off. We've done well for time today. That's really good. <laughs> uh, so if there's no more questions, I think all that's left for us to say is thank you once again to Madison and Kirsten for your really, really interesting uh, presentations and for the questions and comments. I uh, really appreciate you sharing our work, you sharing your work with us today. Um, so thank you very much. We'll be back at the same time 